Welcome to Wrestling With Heart, a podcast looking at pro wrestlers giving back to their community. Join me, Stanley Carr, as I interview wrestling's hottest names who use their platforms as entertainers to raise awareness and do community service. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Wrestling With Heart. This is the show where we talk to professional wrestlers about their careers in the ring and out of the ring, talking about acts of goodwill and community service and charity work and all that good stuff. And with me today is a very special guest. She's a former NWA Women's Champion. She's wrestled all over the country, all around the world. And she's currently a part of Shimmer. And she's also got a charity that she's going to talk to us about today. It is my pleasure to welcome to the show, Lexi Fife. Welcome to the show, Lexi. Thank you for having me. This is awesome. Yeah, it's my pleasure. So tell me about your childhood. Where did you grow up? Um, I was uh, born and raised in New Jersey um, and then ended up uh, down in North Carolina. I went to college down there and that's where I got into wrestling and, you know, the rest is, <laughs> is history. I live in Florida now, though, so I've moved around a little bit. Yeah, get to see a little bit of everything, but it's yeah. re- really nice where you are, relaxing. It is. It really is. I live in a really nice part of Florida. We have a lot of woods and hiking and kayaking and manatees. All the outdoor stuff. Yeah. Nice. So you mentioned earlier you got into wrestling when you went to North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And what really got you hooked as far as? Well, I mean, I've always loved wrestling. And I always watched. I watched it when I was really little. um, And I loved uh, just the theatrics about it. And, like, I don't know, watching the Ultimate Warrior and all his colors and him shaking the Mm -hmm. ropes and stuff. And then um, I was really little. But, you know, I was young. And then I went to North Carolina and um, I watched wrestling at college with, you know, we'd get together and have little wrestling parties and WrestleMania parties. And um, I'd go to some of the WCW and WWF shows. And then I met um, a girl named Brandy Wine at a, at a quote unquote real job that I had. And uh, she was reading a wrestling magazine. And back in the 90s, uh, there wasn't as many women who watched wrestling. And so I saw her reading this wrestling magazine in the break room and I was like, another chick that likes wrestling. So I went up and talked to her, obviously. And um, she said, yeah, she was, I've been um, doing some ballet work for a local uh, you know, independent wrestling group and I'm looking for a training partner. And I went, independent wrestling? What is that? And she's like, oh, well, we do shows at like the National Guard armories and like county fairs and stuff like that. She goes, but I'm not trained to be a wrestler. I just do like some ballet work, you know? I get, you know, grab the jackets. I, you know, hit people over the head with things when my, when my guy's not winning. And I was like, that sounds amazing. Tell me more. And um, so she was looking for a training partner. So she um, said there was a a show at a a National Guard Armory, not too far from where we lived. And I was like, this is perfect. Let me try this out. And I went and I got in the ring before the show and like got thrown around a little bit and was like, this is so much fun. This is what I'm supposed to do, you know? Mm-hmm. So I started training and I, I just kind of never looked back from there. I thought it would be just a weekend gig, like something fun to do occasionally. And, you know, I started getting booked in different places and then I started getting booked overseas and then I started, you know, going across the country and I was like, Ugh. so I quit my real job and I never went back. <laughs> So here's a funny uh, story. Um, I actually went to one of your <laughs> shows like years ago. I was I was 10. It was a show at the fairgrounds in Nashville. And I think you were wrestling in a triple threat match. I think it was for the women's championship. Uh, let's see. Was it what it might have been like? Was it like Christy Ritchie and Tasha Simone? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. Was it? Okay. I, it was for NWA then, I'm sure. Yes. Okay. All yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's so cool, you know, getting to talk to you all these years later. Uh, you were really... only 10, though, huh? Okay, yeah. well, that makes me feel bad. <laughs> no worries, I promise. But um, so, okay, so, you know, the 80s and 90s and into the early 2000s, like, was a huge time for the business. I mean, you had the, the Hulk era, the Hulk Hogan era, the Attitude yeah. era, of course, with Stone Cold, Steve Austin, The Rock, and up until yeah. you know even up to you know the john cena era you know it was, it was huge you know still popular mm-hmm. today obviously but definitely like around that you know late 90s was like a hotbed for pro wrestling so oh yeah i we stayed so busy on the independent like I, like i said i didn't even know there was such a thing as independent wrestling you know mm-hmm. all i knew was wcw 
WW, you know, F back then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, like ECW was just starting. They weren't like, they hadn't really made a name yet. They were just right. kind of like, you were hearing little bits and pieces yeah. here and there. There was no internet back then. I mean, mm -hmm. there was, but not like, I mean, wasn't as prevalent people had some computers, now. but we didn't have the World Wide web like we do now. And we right. just get any, you know, all the information instantly. So you didn't know about these shows unless you happen to glance up and see a poster somewhere. Right. So when I started um, training and then started getting booked, I realized that, you know, like, like basically any North, any national guard armory in North Carolina, Tennessee and Virginia, I probably could still tell you where they are because like we hit them all and we hit all mm -hmm. the County fairs and all the state fairs. And like, so I stayed busy. Like I was only home a couple of days a week here and there. It was almost like, you know, working for WWE and doing all the house shows. So you only come mm -hmm. home on like Wednesday, Thursday, you know, it was, yeah. you know, that's how busy we were able to stay. Um, I broke it in 1995 and I started wrestling at the end of that year. Mm -hmm. And so like, you know, 96 through like 99, like were like, it was a, it was, it was wonderful to be a, you know, a, an independent wrestler back then. I mean, we had shows all the time. You had your pick of shows, you know, no doubt. And so one of the camps that you went to while you were training was the Omega camp. Yeah. And, and you got to, you got to uh, I rub shoulders with the Hardys. Uh, a couple of times and a lot of people came from that camp that went on to be big stars the hardys shannon moore gregory helms just to name a few people i mean that had to have been a fun experience yeah um it was uh, it's funny i and i've told the story before but um i i was kind of I, don't know, I want to put this nicely. I, I wasn't i didn't feel like i was progressing at the school that brandy wine and i were at um, he didn't like us to um, wrestle with the with the men at the time because you know it, they kept it really you know apart. And I was like, well, if I don't wrestle with these other people who know what they're doing, it's harder for me to get better. And I went to a show. It was in North Carolina, and uh, Matt and Jeff Hardy were on it, and a few other people um, that you just named. Mm -hmm. And um, Matt was like, after my match, it was a it was a baseball show. It was like we had a, a show like it was like a double header and so they had a wrestling show in between the, the two games yeah and mm -hmm. um so where our locker room was was far away from where the matches were being held so we weren't able to watch each other's matches so when i got driven back on the golf cart back to the, the locker room area matt was like hey how'd your match go and i was like oh terrible i don't even know if i should be doing this i don't feel like i'm getting any better I just feel like I'm staying the same and I'm, I, I want to progress and I don't, I don't like feeling like this. And he was like, well, you know, we get together like every weekend, usually on Sundays um, and train at, um, you know, at my friend's house and down in, you know, Cameron. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and so like, it wasn't oh, that far. It was like an hour and a half for me. So I was like, well, you, can I come, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So I went down there and um, they beat the ever living crap out of me. They just, hit hard and they gave me a lot of big bumps and stuff like that nothing dangerous i didn't come sure. away with black eyes or anything like yeah. that yeah it was but, like they um, were working it, stiff but yeah they they treated me like every other wrestler you know they didn't treat me differently because i was a girl you know that type of thing and um and then we sat around and watched the pay-per-view that night that was like their their thing or you know so it was mm -hmm. a sunday night and i was listening to matt dissect the matches like he'd be like oh you know so and so did that there and i you know i really like that because it led to this and then he went well i would probably have done that a little different and i was just like wait what tell what what is this like it just opened my eyes to like the whole storytelling part of wrestling that i hadn't been it hadn't been talked to that uh, you know about that to me before no. and i was like oh so like if I do this and that and the other, and then the crowd's gonna react like this, and then it just made sense to me. And so so I blame Matt Hardy for me still being in wrestling and <laughs> <laughs> feeling like this nowadays. Um, so yeah, so I kept going back and I, I would come back you know, every week that they, you know, because they weren't signed to WWE yet. Mm -hmm. So so every Sunday we were out there um in this crappy ring in the middle of nowhere in somebody's backyard like i mean it sounds like we're a bunch of backyard wrestlers which you know it, it, it's funny i mean mm -hmm. the ring had you know the ring went like this like i mean it was okay. warped there was no padding anywhere it was it was ridiculous and i loved every minute of it because just listening to um you know his brain work <laughs> was amazing and um 
And I, I learned more in the little time that I had with them before they got signed and went off than I did in the first two years of, of my training. So they definitely, both of them have great wrestling minds. They know what works yeah. and what doesn't work and look at them. They've multi multiple time tag team champions. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't get anybody else, you know, better and better to learn from legends like them, the Hardy boys. At the very least, I don't know anybody in, in our, our little, our little group that at least didn't go on to be like, you know, jobbers, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like show right. up and put somebody over type people. Oh yeah. Um, you know, not all of us had contracts, but all of us worked for at least some of the big companies at some point in time. It was just an amazing um, group of, of wrestlers. No doubt. No doubt about it. Who are some of the people like over the course of your career that you've enjoyed working with? Um, I mean, some of the ones that I really enjoyed the most are ones that um, might not be even well known, like Mighty Heidi, who lived in Tennessee. I had some phenomenal matches with her. Um, and uh, we just like clicked in the ring, like we just um, really could feed off of each other well. Um, Brandywine, obviously, my original training partner, we went on to have some really good feuds. Um, Leilani Kai, oh my mm. gosh, I can't say enough to, for Leilani Kai because, um, Another you know, I'd only been in the business for a very short time and I was blessed to um, be put in a program against her. And it was, um, she was, I, I don't even, I, I don't have the words. Can you tell? I'm stuttering. Um, yeah. Just the, the amount of just like learning from her in the ring, like I was just like, she is amazing. She can make everybody look like a million dollars and her hits look like they're taking your hat off. And I mean, there was just so much, you know, and this is like when she was like past her prime, but she wasn't, you know, mm, and, yeah. um, and then I got to go on an overseas tour with Wendy Richter. That was amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, we got, we were on tour together for 30 days. We did 16 different shows. Um, it, it I, you know, like I, I can't go, I can go on about how much I learned from her too. Just, uh, the way she could get the crowd to react the way she wanted and everything was just amazing. Um, you know, even then, like she had been kind of out of the business for a while. She got called out of basic retirement to go on this tour. And I was like, I got, I got picked. Oh, you know, I'd only been in the business like four years. I was such a newbie, you know, and, and I was going on tour with Wendy Richter, you know? Um, so there's, you know, uh, there's been, and there's been so many, I've got so many awesome wrestling family now. It's, it's ridiculous. And I, and I'm blessed to step in the ring with even the ones that weren't really good. I learned from, because I learned how to cover the mistakes or whatever, you know? So it's, you know, so everybody I've been in the ring with has been a blessing in some way or another. I also wanted to touch on something. Um, I saw that you had a long time friendship with the wrestler Daphne, the late wrestler Daphne who passed yeah. away. Uh, last year uh, tell me about tell me about your relationship with her as you know um she was my my sister from another mister like you know we we uh we were um this this is the hard one for me to talk about because I still cry a lot um mm -hmm. yeah so um she she suffered from mental illness she was um she had bipolar disorder and um and she uh was an alcoholic and all of that is online so I'm not you know speaking mm -hmm. out of turn um and she um suffered from a good many years and tried so many different things and they were having they had a lot of trouble trying to get her medication regulated i'm not sure what you know about bipolar disorder but mm -hmm. um it, it you have to keep tweaking that medicine and sometimes it doesn't work and unfortunately with her um like I have a friend who's um, bipolar and she suffers on the manic side and that's terrible in itself, but it, it's, it's a little bit better. Uh, Daphne always skewed to the depressed self, the, the, the depressed side of it. And, um, and over the last um, year or so um, of her life, she was living up in the Atlanta area and, um, and I could tell she was getting more and more just depressed. Like she didn't want to live there. And we, and her friends and I were trying to talk her into either moving out to where her family, her dad and her brother lived or moving back down here to Florida where she had all of us, like our, our support system. And, um, and unfortunately um, she got to that point where her brain was lying to her and she um, decided to take her own life. And um, it's, uh, it's been a really hard year. <laughs> so we're just over the year. Um, you know, September 1st was a year 
and um you know we still cry about it a lot um uh, it's we try to do um a, a lot of us check in on each other a lot more um we do stuff like that my daughter's blowing me kisses because she knows i'm upset <laughs> thank you honey um uh, you know and uh so i want to tell everybody uh speaking of that like um you know if you're feeling down you're feeling alone um remember your brain lies to you when you suffer especially with like bipolar disorder and depression um sometimes your medication lies to you because you're not on the right one or your doctor's not you know helping you enough um as a country we don't do as in the world period but as a country especially we don't do enough to help those um that suffer from mental illnesses and um we need to have more awareness of that and take the stigma away because mm -hmm. um because people are afraid to talk about it when right. you know when they're depressed or if they're having you know these dark feelings like um and our system fails us in a lot of ways because i know when i was talking to to daphne especially over the last couple months um if she mentioned the word suicide like her therapist is automatically supposed to call you know and 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 yeah. have her admitted well she just wants to talk about suicidal feelings she's not like you know and and so like there's the, the trigger words and stuff like that we have to like just work on um i'm not being very eloquent with my words right now because no, i am a little okay. upset it's, okay. like, it, it, it's a um, hard subject so um but we have to work on like our system and how we deal with um you know people that suffer from mental illnesses and um and you know, take away some of those things. Like I, it took me a little while to tell people, like when people talk about Daphne, I'm like, I have to say the word she committed suicide. Like it was hard for me to say that or oh, she sure. took her own life. Like, you know, and I do like to say stuff like, you know, she lost her battle with her mental illness because it is an illness. It's like anything else. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you have diabetes, you're going to take a shot for insulin. If you have a mental illness, you have to take medication for it. It shouldn't be, uh, a quiet thing a, a hush hush thing a, i'm embarrassed right. it's Absolutely. just it's just an illness like everybody else can have yeah, yeah. and so so i miss her <laughs> i do too i think i can speak for a, a lot of wrestling fans who miss her as well you're now working on a charity of your own right called jar of hope well, it's not that. my charity um it's a charity that i become involved with um okay yeah so jar of hope um it's it's uh, a, a charity that was started by a father of a young boy who has Duchenne MS. Um, so it's a form of multiple sclerosis that affects um, children. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it is a terminal illness. And, um, you know, most of them don't live into adulthood. Um, or if they do, it's in a very, you know, there just a few of them do. Mm -hmm. um, it works just like MS does, um, but faster. Um, so his son went from, you know, being four years old and walking around and they noticed some, some, some differences. And so they brought him to get some tests, but he was walking, talking, you know, able, fully mobile, you know, type of thing, but mm -hmm. having just some issues. And so now um, he's wheelchair bound um, and um, he's doing well considering because um, they've got him on, a, on some protocols that they're working on, like experimental stuff, really, because mm -hmm. it's, it's terminal. So why not yeah. try stuff? But they have this um, this trial that they want to do, and the University of Florida down here in, um, in Tallahassee has offered to run the trial, but they need the funding. And unfortunately, it's considered a rare disease. Um, so like only 20,000 people in the world have been diagnosed with this. And so the funding is not there. It's not like some of the other cancers and some of the other diseases that get a lot of funding because millions and millions of people have it or could have it, you know, it's considered a rare disease. But in my mind, I'm like, okay, it might be a rare disease, but those 20,000 people who have already been diagnosed with it and people who are coming, you know, who are being born that will have it, they're going to die if we don't do anything about this. Mm -hmm. I hate it. And I mean, and that's the, that's the, the bald truth of it, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, so I met James Raffone at a, at a, I, I'm a runner now. <laughs> so, you know, I went from like extreme wrestling, you know, wrestling, beating up my body to like doing extreme ultra marathon, crazy stuff. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I met James Raffone out in 2019 at the Grand Grande Grand Ultra, which is this race that is run out in um, Arizona, Utah, through the deserts, up through these mountains. It's crazy. It's 180, almost 180 miles of 
craziness. And I went from Florida where, you know, you walk outside and you sweat to going there and going, I can't breathe. It's so dry. Um, but anyways, I met him out there because when his son was diagnosed, he sold his construction business, started Jar of Hope and said, I'm going to do all that I can to hopefully find a cure for my son. But if I can't do that, find a cure for those who come after him. And so he does like these extreme sports and running events and things like that. So to raise awareness um, for Jar of Hope and, you know, to hopefully raise the money so that they can run this big trial and, and hopefully save lives. Um, and um, I was really intrigued by his story, uh, but then COVID hit and like, you know, we weren't doing anything and everything. So then I went back to the G2G again this year, just recently um, in September and he was there again with his group. They run it like every year. And so we sat down and had some more conversations about it. And I really wanted to become involved. So um, I do a lot of Disney races. I'm a Disney fanatic. I love Disney, oh, yeah. all things Disney. And they have I races in there. Yeah. They, you know, so yeah, I did my first Disney marathon World. was a Disney marathon. And then I've done mm -hmm. this challenge called the Dopey Challenge, which is where you run a 5K on Thursday, a 10K on Friday, a half marathon, so 13 miles, 13.1 miles on Saturday, and then a full marathon, 26.2 miles on Sunday. I've done that like four times already. So this will, this will be my fifth time doing it. And um, I decided to do it for Jar of Hope. Um, my daughter is running the 5K and the 10K with me. She's still too young to do the other ones, um, but she's a runner too. Um, and, um, and Kimberly um, is also running the Dopey mm -hmm. Challenge and she's doing yeah. it for um, Jar of Hope too. So we will be out there in our Disney costumes, wearing our Jar of Hope patches and our Jar of Hope flag, and we're trying to raise money. So I'm, I'm trying to raise $2,000 um, as part of my thing for them. And then, um, and she, so is Kimberly. And then I've got to raise $900 for my daughter to run the two races. That's kind of like the deal we made with mm -hmm. them. And then just get the word out. Hey, Lexi, I just want to say thank you very much uh, for coming on here. It really means a lot to me and to the listeners that are there watching and listening to the podcast. Where can people find you on social media to know more about you and any upcoming shows you have or? Um, pretty much all my social media is at Slammin' Ladies. That's Slammin' with no G, S-L-A-M-M-I-N-L-A-D-I-E-S. Um, it'll, you know, that's where like my Twitter and my Insta and my Facebook are. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, check it out. I do funny little skits on Insta now. I've gotten into this, like, every, Kira Hogan's like, you got to do reels. You got to do reels. I'm like, oh, my girl, do some reels. <laughs> you know? So yeah. have fun with it. It's silly. It's stupid sometimes I feel so but then I have fun with it I'm like oh if it'll make it, that's another thing if it'll make somebody laugh I'm for it the jar of hope link is up if anybody wants to donate click that link <laughs> definitely well again uh thank you again for coming on the show and uh you're more than welcome to come back anytime and uh thank you, thank you again thanks I definitely will I had a good time talking to you thank you yeah all right. Take care. This is Wrestling With Heart. I hope you found this podcast to be informative and entertaining. If you did, please hit the subscribe button and look out for the next edition.